uh, before. I know, I'll forget to say it later. Uh, see, you guys are all day A, I think, right? Yes. <clears throat> um, the test for tomorrow. So I had somebody ask me if they could take it today because they were going to be leaving out of town tomorrow. And uh, I guess I kind of thought about it. The more I thought about it, uh, it 100% makes sense for me to just open up the test for everybody today. Like, you know, I don't have a problem with you taking the test early. Uh, so what I did was I opened up the test and the test closes tomorrow. So you just basically have to make sure to take the test by tomorrow at the end of the school day. So whatever that is, 3.30. Um, so you guys will all be at home tomorrow. Um, basically the only people that really should take it tomorrow or like have to take it tomorrow is if you're a B day student and you're in school tomorrow, uh, you'd, you'd have nothing else to do during the hour otherwise. Um, tomorrow is not going to be a required day for us to meet on video. Um, I'll basically be online the whole time. And uh, so if you guys have questions or problems with your test, then you can certainly just kind of ask away or message me or whatever. Um, but otherwise, you don't necessarily have to meet tomorrow. And I just want to make sure you take your test by the end of the day tomorrow. So today I'm going to be doing the notes for 4.1 and 4.2 because those two days are swapped. Um, but if you feel like you're ready for the test, you can pretty much take it whenever. Uh, okay, so there's a, there's a lot of writing today. And uh, I don't know the best route to do that. So if we were in the classroom, this is normally a section where I would have stuff printed out for you so that you wouldn't have to write down everything. And this is where I say, I don't know the best way to do that. Um, I'm, I'm certainly recording these, you know, so you'll have it on a video. Um, so if, if you feel like it's too much writing for you, um, you know, basically try to write down little bits to yourself like notes. And, uh, you know, the video, video is certainly something that I'll be saving and you can just look up at any time too. So I just kind of want to give you a heads up ahead of time that there'll be, you know, a lot of writing. So if you're a person that's not big on that, do know that I'm saving this so we can do it afterwards. Okay. So 4.1 is, is basically all about graphs. Um, the first thing that we're going to start with is relating graphs to situations. So, I just copied this situation on the textbook because, you know, I'm not very imaginative. And uh, so I didn't uh, I didn't want to have to try to think up a situation that worked out well. So the air temperature was constant for several hours at the beginning of the day and then rose steadily for several hours. It stayed the same temperature for most of the day before dropping sharply at sundown. <laughs> I see that I forgot to share my screen. Thank you for letting me know. Here you go. <laughs> Sorry about that. <clears throat> I was a little flustered. I was trying to bring in my big giant packages from Amazon. Uh, okay, so this was kind of what I was talking about where I was trying to say there's tons of notes. Um, lots of lots to write down. So I, however you want to do it is fine. So we've got this situation. And um, we're going to try to match it up to one of those graphs. So one of these graphs is a, is a decently accurate representation of that situation. And we want to go through and kind of figure that out. So the side of the graph represents temperature. The bottom of the graph represents over time. So, I mean, th this definitely is numbers and things. But if you just want to think about it as moving to the right, just basically means as things are happening. Okay. And this, the height of the graph is temperature. So this would be like 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, you know, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 18, 19, 20, 19, 18, 17, 16, 9. Hold on a sec. I just realized this, but why did you go? Well, why did you put the couch in the garage? I'm teaching. Also, <laughs> I got something for ten bucks with my balance. No, no. Why? Okay. Um. 
Oh, yeah. So that's, that's kind of how you interpret this graph. Uh, so what I, what I thought we would do is we would kind of look at the situation and break it apart. Because every one of these graphs looks like they have different sections. So it says the air temperature was constant for several hours at the beginning of the day. So the first part of our graph, a constant temperature would mean that it is not going up or down. So that's kind of telling me the first part of my graph should be flat. And these two graphs start off with a flat section. The third graph, the temperature is rising. So that tells me third graph immediately is not an option because it doesn't even fit that first situation. Okay. Then it says, then it rose steadily for the next several hours. Rose steadily would mean the temperature is going up. Well, look at graph A, up. Graph B, up. All right, well, both of them still match. Third thing, it stayed the same temperature for most of the day. Well, same temperature would mean the temperature is not going up or down. So then that should be another flat section. This is definitely a flat section. This could be interpreted as flat, um, but not for very long. And this kind of says for most of the day. So my guess is our answer is going to be B. But then let's uh, look at the last part before dropping sharply at sundown. So that would mean it would go down fast. And that would be the end of the day. This one goes down fast. Uh, but graph A also has a fifth section that we don't have in our situation. So that definitely tells me it's going to be B. Now, underneath, I did take the, the information from the problem and kind of color-coded it to match up for you guys. So if there's something you want to write down from this, it might be a good idea, you know, right here is probably what would help you. It's basically trying to match up the words from the paragraph to what the graph looks like. Um, I don't know, it, this, this was kind of a tough section for me to, you know, like call on you guys with questions for much. Um, do you guys, is there something that I, we just covered that went over that maybe you want me to explain better, more? All right. Again, I, you know, like if I'm, I'm going to be moving kind of fast today so that we get done in time. If there is something that you didn't get a chance to write down, do know that that definitely is like one of the reasons I like recording this so that you could go back and, and look at it again. You know, pause the video wherever. Okay, here's a second piece of information we're going to go over. Uh, it's discrete graphs versus continuous graphs. So a discrete graph is one that has individual pieces of information. So the graph would look basically like dots, you know. Uh, or bars, or, you know, something like that. Basically, the information that's there would all be separated some way or form. A continuous graph is a graph with data that is all connected together. Um, so that could look like curves. It could just look like a straight line. Uh, but basically, a continuous graph means that they're all connected. And that's the two situations. So what we're going to do, I'm trying to get both of them on the same screen. I don't know if I can. I'll leave it here for a minute so that you guys can uh, write down out of that. You know, write something to yourself about what a discrete graph and what a continuous graph is. Hopefully you got most of that. Otherwise, certainly speak up if you want me to keep it on here a little bit more. 
here's the two situations where I wanted us to try to determine which one of the two it would be. The first situation is a graph that would show the speed of you biking um, on a bike ride. So they basically like bike speed versus time, you know. Second graph, B, is a graph of how much money you would make selling tickets. So this the side of the graph would be the amount of money that you collect. The bottom of the graph would be how many tickets you sell. So we have to determine which one of these would be a continuous graph, which one would be a discrete graph. Who should we go with? AJ? AJ, how about you? Do you want to have the honor of starting us off? Nope. <laughs> wow. Shot down. How about this? How about you type the answer? Let's give you, uh, I don't know which would be easier for you. Would you rather do A or B? You can type it if you need to. I don't care. And then, um, Olivia? Olivia, do you think you can help me with one of these two? Excellent. AJ denied me already. Oh, all right. I'd prefer neither, but I'll do A. Oh, I appreciate it, AJ. Okay. While AJ is typing out the answer for A, and the only answer I want you to do is just tell me if it's a discrete graph or a continuous graph. I don't, we're not graphing these. Olivia um, on B would be, would the graph be like a solid continuous line or would the graph be like individual things? Okay, you're 100% correct. Do you know why? Or were you just kind of guessing? Yeah, but it's correct. So if I am selling tickets, A is continuous, AJ. Perfect. That is perfect continuous graph. Okay, so if, I'll start with B since Libby answered that one first. <clears throat> it is a discrete graph, and that's because if you think of the graph, the number on the bottom is your tickets, right? So, one, two, three, four, whatever. Well, say each ticket is a buck. We'll make it easy. Well, then your answer would be, oh, I only saw part of that. It was behind the window. Uh, so the ticket one definitely is going to be discrete because uh, each ticket is a certain dollar amount, right? So one ticket would give you a dollar, two tickets, two dollars, three, three dollars. And if I asked you about like a dollar thirty-seven, well, you're not going to have a dollar thirty-seven because you can't sell part of a ticket. So because tickets are kind of a whole amount it kind of forces the graph to be separate answers. And uh, AJ was correct with the continuous graph because your bike ride, well, your speed constantly goes up and down, and time is something that continually moves on. So if you, uh, you know, if you have one of those uh, speedometers on your bike or, uh, or, you know, say you have like a Fitbit or something like that, um, they will, they can give you a graph that shows your distance versus speed versus time, whatever. So the graph for a bike ride would go like that, you know, like say this means you're going downhill, so you'd speed up and then you're on flat ground and you go down a little bit again. So it, it's basically just describing the different types of graphs. And, uh, that was pretty much it for 4.1. 4.1 is, Ridiculous. Easy. You'll love it. It's free points on the test, basically. Okay, so 4.2 is where 
I think you've seen this information before, but this is where there's a ton of writing, and that's where I didn't know what would work best for you guys. So a relation. A relation is just any two sets of numbers that are compared to each other. And it doesn't matter what those two sets of numbers stand for. They don't have to be related. Um, you know, the word relations just means that you'll, you are relating them by comparing them. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of different ways you can show relations. Um, these are the most common. So I know when I was making up notes, it was, it was bothering me because it felt sloppy. So I kind of just like put up those stupid boxes around stuff. Well, ordered pairs. So points, you know, that's one way of showing two numbers together. A table is really common. Like that's probably the most common thing there is because of spreadsheets. Um, a graph. You're used to seeing graphs. Mapping, eh. Um, mapping the book and the state standardized tests and all of that say that mapping is a common way of showing information. I can tell you that I literally have never seen a mapping outside of a math textbook ever. So uh, we have to know them, and you're going to be tested on them, like state standards and et cetera. Uh, I don't know. It's stupid. But we have to know them. They're just a different way of showing information. Okay. <clears throat> so 4.2 example 1 was just the different ways of showing numbers. 4.2 is talking about what the numbers are. Okay. And uh, so most people are going to refer to them as X values and Y values, which totally is fine. Uh, but they're not always going to be X and Y. And uh, so they usually refer to the X information as the domain and the Y information as the range. <clears throat> so I, I wanted to put some different kinds of examples up here so that we would do these together. So if you're only writing down little bits of notes, um, these would be good ones to put in your notes to actually write these problems down because we're going to write the answers for them. So underneath each picture or set of information, we're going to write the domain and range. And uh, I can, I think you can see all of C. I know it's kind of cut off on the recording. Uh, see, Christian, so are you in the classroom or are you at home today? Because I know you said you forgot your mic. Or maybe you said your headphones. So how are you listening to it? Are you just watching me talk? Okay. <laughs> All right. Oh, okay. Okay. You got, so you got sound on. Excellent. <clears throat> well, then the Chromebook has a microphone on it. So you just have it turned down. Okay. So I can call on you. Good. Christian. That's what I was, this was me taking a super long time to uh, get to that. Christian, I was hoping you could help me with A. Which X values are shown in picture A. So X is that, this is Y. And I can certainly help you with it and go along. Uh, yeah, but you don't have to type. You can just like speak and it works. Yep. So what we generally do is we draw this super hard parentheses, which is called a brace. And I am, I am atrocious at writing them. They're hard, uh, but it's called a brace. And we usually just list the numbers individually that the domain covers and the range covers. And I, I say individually because for picture A, I see individual answers, like, you know, individual numbers.
And uh, I can help you along with this too if you need Christian. That was why I was saying the microphone. Um, it's definitely harder to help from typing. Uh, <clears throat> while we're waiting for that one, uh, Jacob, do you think you could help me with B? Oh, okay. I'll give you. Yep, I can help you, Christian. Jacob, are you there? Oh, everybody's like abandoning their microphone. Do you realize? Do you guys realize how much less fun uh, learning is if you become roboticized? When you become anonymous, when you become anonymous, it uh, it totally takes any enjoyment out of it. The class is too quiet. Well, isn't there only like eight of you? I mean, like when you speak, everybody's going to hear you anyway. <laughs> yes, Caleb, that is perfect. Okay, so Caleb kind of helped me with B. It's okay if it's dead silence. I'm hoping when we go to distance learning, you guys will speak when you're at your house. How's that? Because this is, this is super awkward. Like, I hate listening to myself. Okay, excellent. Okay, so Caleb said, uh, domain is x values, range is y values. So the domain for B is 1, 2, and 4. Because those are the x numbers used. And the range for B is the y values. Uh, usually you put them in number order. 1, 3, and 8. So you're basically just answering which numbers are used. So if I go back to A, for Christian's problem. If I'm looking at the domain, I can see that there are points above x equals 1, and there are points above x equals 2, so my domain is 1 and 2. So given that, do you think you could help me with the range, Christian? Do you think you could answer which numbers are used for the range on A? So you're basically trying to look. Perfect. Uh, oh, that actually brings up a good point. So you answered 1, 1, and 2, which is true. So there's a point at a height of 1, there's a point at a height of 1, and a point at a height of 2. You actually you you can write multiples if you want. You don't have to write multiples. So if you want to just write 1 and 2 rather than 1, 1, and 2, uh, they're both correct, though. So like on the test, I'll, I'll give you guys perfect credit for either way. But very good, very good. Okay, C. Um, Sophie. How about C? Perfect. It's the first numbers because those are the x values. Okay. Oh, that was terrible. Let me rewrite that. Okay. Perfect. Uh, so it's not wrong if you go, if you don't put them in number order. I, I'm not going to mark you wrong if you don't put them in number order. Usually you just get, you just, it's kind of normal to do that. But it's not wrong if you just read them in the way they're listed. Um, excellent job so far. Once you figure these out, they're super easy. It's just they're, you're not used to talking about tomato range. Okay, the last one I, I held off on, because students usually have a little more trouble with it. Okay, so on this picture, when I'm looking up there, it's a solid line. So it's not, it's not individual numbers. So I can't just write 0, 1, 2. A solid line means that if I'm 
the farthest to the left, zero is like the first number it shows. And then it shows every single number until x equals 2. So for my domain, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say 0 less than or equal to x less than or equal to 2. Because x is in between 0 and 2. So if you have a solid line, that's kind of how you write it. And then the range, well, the you generally do smallest to biggest. So the, the lowest point is at a height of 1. And then it's every single height up until 2. So then I would say my range goes from 1 to 2. And every y in between. So I wanted to have an example for you guys in your notes so that you can see how to write these answers because these are the ones that usually trip up students. Okay. I, uh, I know we've already been recording 26 minutes, but I kind of wanted to rush everything to get to this last part because this is going to be the part that's going to be the most I don't want to say most important in Algebra 1, but it gets used a lot in Algebra 1. Well, so we start talking about functions. Um, okay, so I know most of you don't like speaking out loud because it feels awkward. Uh, could you either write yes or no in the chat if you've heard of functions? I want to know how much I should speak about them first. So just answer yes or no. Okay. So, yeah, yeah. so I got a mixture of answers. All right. Well, that's, I mean, that's part of the weird thing is everybody comes from different schools and different cities. and it's, it's what happens at high school. Okay. So a function is a special kind of relation. So a relation basically just meant a bunch of numbers. A function is a very specific relation where every x value, which are referred to as inputs, has only one answer associated to it. So this is actually kind of the basis of computer coding, like computer programming. Is they, they program, you know, like, like when you have a keyboard. If you push the letter F, Right? So if we have an F, F for chat here. If you push, if you push the letter F, the only thing that you want to happen is have an F come up on screen. So coding is considered a function because when you do something, you want only one thing to happen. Okay. Um, if, if I push the letter F and all of a sudden the letter K comes up, and then the letter Z comes up. Well, that's not a function because you're getting different happenings. So a function is when every input or X value has only one associated answer or Y value. So that's what I wrote down there. A function is when each input of a relation is only tied to one output. So what I wanted to do was I wanted to look at the different ways that we do functions, right? Or uh, relations. And I want us to go through and talk about how we determine if it's a function or not. So I wanted to save most of our time for today to this. So if you guys can, why don't you write down A, B, and C first, just the three small tables. And then we are going to answer if they are a function or not.
Um, Logan, do you think you could help me with A or B or C? I don't know which one's easiest for you, but I'll walk through it with you. <laughs> okay, so maybe I'll try to give you the easier. I don't want to say easier because I don't want you to feel bad if you get it wrong. Let's start with B. So, oh, go ahead. Okay, is there a reason that you don't think it is? You're correct, though. You're correct. Okay, so an input of 2, so the x value, has two different answers. This one is going to be no, because 2 has two outputs. Two, if I hit 2 on the keyboard, I only want one thing to happen. So it's easiest to look at the ones that are no. <clears throat> and maybe I'll scroll down to this part. So usually, usually I think the stuff the textbooks put, it, put in there is pretty lame. This was advice from a fellow student, and it was written in the textbook. And the way this is written is exactly how I usually do it. So it says, I decide whether a list of ordered pairs is a function by looking at the x values. If they're all different, then it automatically is a function. If, for some reason, you have two of the same x values, oh, duh, I use them in most. If you have two of the same x values, you probably can't even see that yellow line. Well, if you have two of the same x values that have different answers, that is when it is not a function. And it has to have different answers. If the all the x values are different to start with, automatically it's a function. Because you can't have any duplicates. So we'll go back up to here. So Logan, Logan was correct on B. Because 2 had two different answers. Uh, let's go to A. Um, what do you think, Caleb? AJ thinks yes. Yes. Perfect. Uh, automatically it's a yes because every x value is different. So guaranteed each x value has only one answer. That's all that matters. I put C up here because this one can be kind of tricky. Does anybody feel like they know C? I don't know if I want to call anybody here. C can be tricky because, you know, they're all the same answer. Okay, do you remember that thing I showed you, the tip from a fellow student? What it says, it says, if the x values are all different, it's automatically a function. This one's yes, because the x values are all different. So because the x values are all different, it's automatically a yes. Whoa, Jesus, AJ's flying. What did I, you said, so we've got a guess, a guess, educated guess, answer. AJ thinks D is yes and E is no. Does anybody have a thought? Crazy. How about you? Do you have a thought on either D or E? Okay, is there a reason? Okay, that's perfect. I mean, like, it, it's kind of weird because of the arrows, um, it, but it's absolutely correct. So each x value is only used once because there's only one arrow coming out of each one. And AJ, that is correct. 
E is null because the number 2 has two different answers associated with it. So basically you have two arrows coming out of it at one number. So that's why it's no. Okay, F and G. Okay, I'm sure you've... Uh, I shouldn't say I'm sure. You, you might have heard of the vertical line test. Um, and it's how you determine if a picture is a function. Um, I think I saw AJ Gutred answering those. Uh, you were, I think you were correct if I remember right. I saw them. So the vertical line test, what you do is you take your finger and you move your finger across a graph. And if your finger only touches the graph one time anywhere, it's a function. If your finger happens to touch a graph twice at the same spot, it is not a function. So because of that, and oh, you know, duh, I forgot, I've got a computer. Huh, yeah, you know what? I'm just, oh, I forgot. I've got a line right there. <laughs> so if I drag my finger or pencil across this picture, well, it only touches the dots one time each time. So we would say yes, it passes the vertical line test. On G, if I'm taking my finger or pencil across this one, oh, right there. Right there is a no, because it touches two points at the same time. So that, oh, so that's called the vertical line test. It's actually it's actually pretty common. You're going to use it quite a few times over the years here, um, because you start getting graphs that look weird and graphs that are kind of goofy, and so you you use the vertical line test to figure out if it's a function or not. Uh, we are done, AJ. Yes, it's not rude. <clears throat> okay, so. Uh, that's why I said I wanted to dedicate most of our time to doing the function stuff today because it's going to end up being the most important for you over the years because it gets used so much. So understanding what a function is is probably the most helpful for you. So we have uh, a little over half hour left for you guys because I know this hour is always super long. Yep. Okay. So what I'm going to do from here on out is I will... Uh, I'll stop the recording here in a second, but I will, uh, I'll wait and leave my Google Meet open until 1.30, whatever it is, that we get done, and I will help you guys with anything you want help with. Remember, the test needs to be done by 3.30 tomorrow, and uh, you're welcome to take it whenever you want. You're welcome to take it today, because I don't think it's even going to take that long either. So, appreciate it, guys.